All right. So Matthew chapter five. Um, of course, last week we had a little buddy come through that we had to cancel our services. So we're um, kind of, uh, I don't want to say behind, but we've had a, a gap of two weeks. So we may not kind of remember, but I'm not going to spend our whole time uh, going through where we are on this. We're we're on, uh, even though it says uh, at, at the top of your handout, lesson three, like any of them, it, you know, they may go two or three weeks or so, depending upon the gaps. I try to, I try to put them to, based upon uh, the outline. So it doesn't just like cut things right in the middle to another lesson. Um, instead of making it up every week, we go through that. But we, uh, a couple weeks ago, on this lesson, which started in chapter five of Matthew, goes all the way through chapter seven, verse 29. And um, uh, it, we are primarily dealing with the Sermon on the Mount. And that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of meat in the Sermon on the Mount. And so your high level outline has this in Roman numeral two, which is the king's authority, which starts in chapter five and goes all the way through chapter nine, verse 38. And um, so this discourse, uh, letter A, discourse one, this Sermon on the Mount, uh, is where a lot of this is going to take place uh, with, our, um, with our lesson. And so uh, we saw, um, let's just look there in Matthew chapter five. I mean, you know, most of you all have been, you know, believers for a long time and sat under various preaching and teaching for many years in a moment that somebody says Matthew 5, most of us immediately, we go to the Sermon on the Mount. And so that's what this is, this was all about. And, um, and if you'll see there at the beginning of, of chapter 5, verse 1, he says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and went and sat down. His disciples uh, uh, came to him. And, uh, and, and basically, if you'll notice in verse 2, uh, all the way through verse 12, you may or may not have like a little subheading on what those things are called. Does anyone uh, have a subheading on what starting in verse, I'm sorry, the Beatitudes, right? So it's the Beatitudes, and that's that that blessed, 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 blessed. What's, what's an, what does blessed mean? What is, it means happy, literally. I mean, it just means happy or joyful. And then he goes through uh, these th these things for these people, and when it says his um, his disciples came to him, we're not talking about the twelve. We're talking about all of his followers, and so there was a great crowd that came to be able to teach or to hear his his teaching. And so, uh, if you remember, um, our Lord here uh, was was what was. Let me ask this: What was unique about the teaching? of Jesus that drew the crowds. Authority. Okay, so there was a level of authority that he was able to do it. What else? What was unique? Why why would the crowds be be drawn to him? Yes, the things that he was speaking were was was teaching that was so much different that they had seen or heard. I mean, not only from hearing what the religious leaders uh, were doing uh, and saying, but also in their practice. You know, in other words, he's going, and as we continue on, we're going to see he's going to be continually pointing out things that are clearly different than anything they had seen or heard. And and what was one of the what was one of the big and this is a loaded question. What was one of the big things that was um, making it such a challenge for the, the people? What was one of the big things that was making it such a challenge? There's a number of things, but from a religious perspective, what was what was some of the what was one of the big challenges they had? All the laws that the Pharisees were imposing on them. Okay, Paul, we did not hear you at all. Say it again. All right, let's try that again. Is that better? That's much better. Okay. It was all the different regulations that were 
made up by the Pharisees in addition to the Mosaic law. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, in other words, it was this burden that was placed on them that was totally beyond what God had intended for his people uh, to be able to do. I mean, you know, f first of all, um, you know, the, the Jews were, were, were intended to be uh, uh, separate people. They were intended to be a light unto the Gentiles. Uh, God had established the law for a number of reasons, but one of the biggest things was to make them these separated people, to protect them, just like, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we have rules and regulations, and, and in some cases, rules and regulations are, are silly and ridiculous, but God is perfect. His were not. They were perfect, but they were also distorted because man got their hands on it. And so it started going down over the centuries. The religious leaders were not only placing additional burdens on people, they were taking things to the extreme so that they could benefit from it, so that they could look like they're even more than they really are. And so you can imagine living in a culture and a society as a Jew that you've got the word of God that's been given to you, and you have the leaders who you look up to that are placing all this incredible burden on people of saying, well, this is, you know, like, I'll just use one of the big ones that just drove people crazy, which was uh, the Sabbath, all right? Now, what was the big thing about the Sabbath that you were not supposed to do? To work. In other words, it was intended to be a day of rest, all right? But they took it to the point to say, well, let's define what work is. And we've talked about that, and I've shared even just some things today, right now, that is ridiculous, you know, amongst Orthodox Jews that you can't even do. I think I, I told you guys about the elevator thing, right? I mean, it's ridiculous, as you know, and that's the kind of things that the burdens, but then they would find loopholes for themselves, all right, to be able to do it. So, so when Jesus comes along, and start smacking them around, you know, they're going, well, we thought that sounded kind of strange. And so Jesus now brings this stuff. So, you know, he goes and he comforts the people in with these beatitudes, uh, which, uh, you know, we, we, we saw, uh, you know, uh, verse three about happy are the humble, uh, happy are the sad, happy are the meek, happy are the hungry, happy are the merciful, happy are the holy, happy are the peacemakers, and happy are the harassed, all right? And, and it kind of, we wrapped up there in verse 12. Well, in verse 13 through 16, we see this breakdown now of righteousness and discipleship. Righteousness and discipleship. Let's look at verses 13 through 16, and then we'll kind of walk through uh, these pieces. So allow me to read that very familiar passage of scripture. Actually, it's kind of, it's one of my favorites because it's so easy to teach because it's practical. All right. So he says, starting in verse 13, uh, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father, which is who is in heaven. All right, so we've heard that over and over again. You've probably heard myriads of teachings on it. You've even heard me teach on these things. But, you know, here's the thing. How many here, rhetorical question, but let's have a little fun, knows what salt is? All right, we know what salt is. How many here knows what light is? We know what light is. So Jesus here, in his incredible, beautiful wisdom, always uses such practical things to get people to understand. Now, I know you know this, but let's just review it again because some of you may not have ever heard this before. What is salt used for? Okay, seasoning, preservatives. Okay, all right, what else? It's flavor. So, say that again, Don. Flavor. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it, that's that seasoning, right? It enhances flavor. It does does all these various different type things. So if you went and 
you, you know, we all know what salt looks like. Now, now, most of us today, you know, we we try to be like foo-foo people, but I like it there because it's supposed to be healthier. We buy the Himalayan salt, right, which is kind of pinkish in color because it's got some other nutrients and stuff like that. You know, and you look at it, it's like, oh, that's pretty. All right. So, um, but salt in itself is basically, if it had no saltiness, what value would it be? It, it's like, it's just a little granular, just throw it away, right? So our Lord here um, is uses th this understanding of salt to get understand that what we as followers of Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. You know, we act as preservatives. How do we act as preservatives in this world? Because he says you're the salt of the earth. How, how do we do that? Say that again. Okay, so for sharing the love of Christ, that's for sure. How else? And it's kind of aligned with that. You, you know, all right, so let me let me help us out. Who lives within us? The Holy Spirit, all right? Could you imagine this world without the influence of the Holy Spirit? All right? So there's a level of preserving <laughs> this earth from the wrath of God, because guess what? Soon... And very soon, we're going to be raptured out of here. And the Bible doesn't say that he will remove the Holy Spirit, but he will put him aside. In other words, the influence that we as believers have on this earth in preserving through the influence of, of godly character, of all of these various different type things, plays a part in preserving. When the rapture takes place... Just like in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit will still be there because he's omnipresent, but his role will be different like it was in the Old Testament. In other words, he will he will uh, uh, work uh, uh, differently, if you will, to accomplish his purposes uh, through that. So the influence. So that's one way that there's a level of preserving influence in the world. Uh, and 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 we must be distinct, all right? In other words, we we have to be distinct. We must be set apart. Um, and so if we if we want to have any influence on the world, it's critical uh, that we are salty. You know, you've heard me say that a lot. We be salty wherever you go. And the reason I say that is that, uh, you know, if, if if I had a big handful of pile of salt right here and hand it around and we all like, horses just munched on it what's one of the first things that you're going to want to do you're going to want to drink water it makes you incredible thirsty so it, it it sucks out all the moisture out of your body all right and so um uh it, so our influence also is is saltiness our lives should make people thirsty in fact the bible even says that let our speech be seasoned with salt. Our Lord was the master of that. To be able to throw out something that would get people like, oh, whoa, oh, and, and draw people in. And so within the Holy Spirit that we should be doing that. Um, and so the other thing about uh, uh, that it should make us unique because we're the salt of the earth. Uh, salt, um, as you know, or may not have known, this is another thing that I've taught in the past, is that uh, salt was one of the ways that people were paid. Uh, in other words, a lot, especially like the Roman soldiers, or it also was a part of bartering. It had it had value, all right? So, you know, that's where the word salary comes from. It comes from the root salt. And so it was a way of paying or it had value. So we are the salt of the earth. Of course, we have value to God. And all of this other thing. So uh, it enhances food. It gives glory to food. Our lives should be giving glory to God and so forth. So our Lord is using this very practical, very familiar thing that would help them to understand. And it clicks in people's minds. So he goes on. He says, um, uh, he also goes on. He says, uh, you're, you're, you're the salt of the earth. But if it's lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? What's the only way to restore saltiness to salt? It is to add salt, 
right? You got to add more. And so it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under, under people's feet. Pastor. Um, yes. I think salt, it can be used as an anesthetic too, like to clean the wound. Oh, yes. So that's isn't right. that something too? Like it can heal hearts and heal wounds that not physical wounds, but like spiritual wounds and yeah. Absolutely. You are right on, sister. Yeah, it it, it has it's used a, a lot of times to do that for medicinal purposes and things like that. It's you know, it's also um, you know, the other thing about uh preserve, uh the preserving factor on it. Uh, how many here um has ever eaten country ham? Right? Now, the way you make country ham is you get that ham and you salt that puppy up in, in like this salty, like goobly glocky blue, whatever, and then you let it like hang and dry, all right, to be able to cure. But I mean, it takes a lot for, you know, uh, country ham to go bad because it's got so much salty preservative in it. And again, it, it applies to our lives. And then as Ms. Barbara said, or Ms. Barb said, uh, you know, the aspect of the, the healing property. So, you know, and we could probably think a lot of other properties of salt and that would certainly align because, you know, if you, I mean, think about that. Think about the, the incredible wisdom of Jesus telling people you're the salt of the earth. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, if I were to say you're the you're the tissue paper of the earth, you'd go, well, I'll try to think of some type of spiritual connection there, practical, but we couldn't. He used something that was incredibly practical that gets us to understand. Now I have a sense you guys are going to be sending me texts and emails going, I thought about something that tissue paper could go to. All right. But the other thing is light. So he goes on with light. Um, he says, you're the light of the world. Now, so what are what are some things that light does? Some of it aligns with the saltiness. What what are some things that light does? Okay, it makes it possible to see. So you can make that spiritual connection. If I'm the, you know, which is interesting. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, speaking of himself. But then he said, right here, you're the light of the world. Well, which is it? It's both. We're actually reflectors of that light. And so it uh, it, it helps us to see. What else does light do? I, I alluded to this on Sunday. Shows you direction, right? It points so that you can see to be able to move a little bit further. Do I? It, it illumines, that's right, it illumines your path. What else does light do? Oh, right. I mean, it's like dispels darkness. I, I probably shared uh, my story before when I was getting certified for scuba. Uh, when I did my deep dive, we were like way, way down deep. And it was like, there was, it, not only do you feel the water, you feel the heaviness of darkness, right? And, and, you know, because our instructors said, turn out your lights. And then he had this little tiny, itty bitty little tiny little, almost like a fiber optic. And it was like, boom, right? You can't do the opposite. You can't, you can't take light and overcome darkness. In other words, if you had light and you somehow had a, a dark flashlight, <laughs> all right, it just wouldn't work because you can't overcome it. But light overcomes the darkness. It's it's an incredible thing. So it does those things. What else does 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 light? And or what are some some characteristics of light? All right, I'll help you. All right. So what is white light? What what is it? What is it? made up of okay i'll help you all right how many here has ever heard of roy g biv thank you homeschool moms all right so roy g biv is red orange yellow green blue indigo violet that's the, the color of the spec what's it honey 
right? That was a good way to do it, right? So, yeah, so 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 what am I when I say red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, what am I what am I those are the those are colors of the color visible spectrum, all right? When you put them all together, you have white light. All right? That's what that's why when it breaks up into different frequencies. So when you have a rainbow, you're seeing a, a, a form of light that breaks up that spectrum that if you you have one, it, it, when you go, so you have red, all right, which is down here and it has a long wavelength, all right? I'm bringing my optics back into practice here. So you have this long wavelength of, uh, of, of red, red light is longer wavelength than violet, all right? And we can see red. Sometimes we see red when we're angry, but I'm talking about the color red, all right? When it gets to the point to where it goes further down the spectrum beyond the, the longer wavelength and you keep getting longer, it's called infrared, all right? Infrared is on that side, but it's not visible, all right? And so infrared provides heat. It's a longer wavelength, but it also can be detected with other things. So you got that end of the spectrum. Now you guys are going to be, you're going to get this. I know you're going to get this. On the other end of the spectrum, you have violet. You've Anybody ever seen violet? Of course you can, because it's the color, it's the frequency that gives it that color. Once you go beyond violet that you can't see anymore, it's called ultraviolet. So it goes out further. It's, all, it's measured in what they call nanometers on both sides. And so uh, you have ultraviolet light on one end, infrared on the other, and then it keep, continues to go on down. That's the harmful type of, of, of light when you get if you have UVA, if you have UVB, and UVC. So, but here's my point. Light is diverse. So when you think about that characteristic of light, I, I take it to the point also where as believers, we're very diverse. We're made up of different ethnicities and all of these different, we're not just one flavor, all right? We're all these various things, but also light provides direction. It provi it, it dispels uh, the darkness, our lives. And that's the whole point that our Lord is saying. He's saying, your life should be salty and bright everywhere you go. And all the characteristics that we just listed here concerning salt and light is what we should exhibit as believers. And so, um, you know, a light is there to, to, to do that. Um, uh, and so then he goes on. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to spend all that time on that, but let me let me go on. You, you think it's like it'll be rapture before we get out of here. Uh, he says, um, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Why? Why can a city on a hill not be hidden? It's, it's got like all kinds of light, right? Um, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. So you know, that's just practical things. So in other words, light has purpose and it also has characteristics and properties. Be that is what he's saying. He says, in the same way, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. In other words, that that last little part there it says give glory to your father who is in heaven is critical why so it's not for yourself because think about this if he says in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works period all right no it, it's all intended to give glory to god it's that's that's his purpose and so all right, I beat that horse. Let's continue on in verses 17 through 20. Letter or number three on there is righteousness in the scriptures. Now he's going to talk more about um, the scriptures. And uh, this section, verses 17 through 20 and a little bit beyond, pre pre presents the, the heart of Jesus's message. It, it, it demonstrates his relationship to the law of God um, and, and so here's the thing, Jesus wasn't presenting some type of rival system to them. It was what God intended. And so, but a true fulfillment of the, the law of the Moses and the words of the prophets, um, and, uh, 
in contrast with these pharisaical traditions. And so when he says the law and the prophets that we're getting ready to, to do, that's he's basically talking about their writings, the, the Old Testament, what we would call that. So, so look here in verse 17 to 20. He says, Do you he says, do not think that I am come to abolish the law and the prophets. Now, let's stop there just a moment. Let's think about the life of Jesus here, what was going on. Why would he why would he say that? He was he was being accused of it, right? And so he goes, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, the writings of that were all love and cherish. He says, but I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We'll, and we'll break that down in a moment. He says, but truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're probably going, whoa, whoa, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're, they're like, uber righteous i'm supposed to surpass that and jesus is going to continue on to go no they want you to think that because they're keeping all these laws he's talking to the heart so let's break this down here he so he, he says um uh he, he says you you probably heard that i'm coming to destroy it i'm telling you here to tell you that uh i have not come to abolish but to fulfill them and that word fulfill there means complete he will completely absolutely fulfill every single piece of what's written about him and what's written. And then he goes on, um, he says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota. Now, some versions, I think King James calls that a jot and a tittle. You ever heard of a jot and a tittle? All right, a jot and a tittle is, is also a, an iota. Uh, 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 nor a dot uh, will pass until the law is accomplished. Jesus' fulfillment, in other words, would extend. He's saying my fulfillment here will be not not kind of a summary of them. What is he saying? It's going to fulfill every single detail, every single detail of what's written. Those 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 jots or those iota uh, and dots and so forth uh, is the smallest Hebrew letter. Literally, it's called a yod. And even to the smallest stroke of a Hebrew letter, that that tittle, all right, or that dot in English, um, uh, this uh, iota would correspond to the dot above the letter I, and and look like an apostrophe. Uh, and the dot or the tittle would be seen a difference between a P and an R. And so these things are important because letters, when you put a bunch of letters together, what do you get? You get a word. And when you put a bunch of words together, you get a you get a sentence and on and on and on, right? So um, a, a letter, if something is off, it can totally change the word or the meaning, right? Uh, it, it could change considerably, especially in Hebrew and Greek. I mean, there's like, you know, just very, very important things. And Jesus said he would fulfill the law by, by obeying it and fulfilling it completely, perfectly, and would fulfill the, the, the prophet's predictions of the Messiah and his kingdom. Now, I know we know that, but now, now think about this. This is what Jesus here is saying. He is saying, I am here to fulfill everything that's been spoken of about not only me, but also the principles and the things in the word of God. We've already seen where he was He was baptized and so forth. He's, he's not come to abolish the law. He's come to fulfill it uh, in, in the proper way and so forth. But when it comes to all the things too that was written of that he was supposed to the coming Messiah to fulfill, it's not just bits and pieces. It's every single detail. And that's why, 
you know, when we when we go back in the, what we've already studied in Matthew, just in his birth, um, it so we know from his birth that the Old Testament said that he was going to be uh, born in Bethlehem. Okay. Now it also said other things about where he would come from. Throw them out to me. He would be called a Nazarene. He would come out of Egypt, right? All right. So there was all those little things around just his birth. If he was born in Bethlehem, he would have fulfilled that part of the prophecy, correct? And you could probably make a case and say, well, we're not sure about the other stuff, but he was definitely born in Bethlehem, so he has to be the Messiah. But the word of God, the jots and the tittles, said all those other pieces. He would come out of Egypt. My son would come out of Egypt. He would be called a Nazarene. There would be, I'm trying to remember all the bits and pieces, but he fulfilled every single one of those. And you guys know what I'm going to say. If he fulfilled every single thing on his first coming, then that means he's going to fulfill every single thing on his second coming. So when you think about what we know about what's going to come, based on what we've written of the coming Messiah, Jesus coming back, that's pretty exciting because it's going to happen exactly as described. Every jot, every tittle, every little nuance is going to take place. Now, some of it, you know, like when John was describing some things, he did his best. It's like, well, it kind of looked like this, but other things, it was pretty, pretty clear. All right, I'll, I'll move on. Um, but, um, you know, to look here on my notes here. Jesus said that he would fulfill the law by obeying it perfectly, but the responsibility of the people was made clear. He goes on, he says, that, in other words, people were seeking righteousness. Why were they seeking righteousness? I'll take a sip while you're thinking. Why were the people seeking righteousness? Righteous to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, you have to be righteous. In other words, where did they get that from? Yeah, the word of God. The word of God told them. There's a, there's a level of righteousness that's expected of you. All right. Uh, it, 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 in addition, it, it, you could take it to the point that, that really to be in God's favor, you had to be perfect. Uh, pretty much got it, it done it. All right. They missed the point uh, as to we can't fulfill perfection. And, and he goes on. He says, uh, he says, um, for I tell you, unless your righteousness, verse 20, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So here's the thing. The scribes and the Pharisees, based on what we know about them, how would you describe their righteousness? Anybody, somebody online. How would you describe their righteousness? And unmute yourself. Just as an outward show. Okay. So it would be considered external, right? It's an external outward show external righteousness and that is what the pharisees were doing in other words their measure of righteousness was do not be their level of righteousness was for show and so forth incredibly external do this do this you remember our lord and we'll see it eventually to where he slaps them around he says you're so concerned with the outside of the cup you're missing you need to clean the inside all right so True righteousness, external or internal? It's internal, which flows to the external. And so our Lord here is basically, he's saying, you know, the righteousness that, that, that they were currently seeking, that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, was insufficient for entrance into the kingdom that Jesus was offering. The, the, the righteousness that Jesus is uh, demanding is uh not merely external, of course, that that's where it's going to manifest itself. Uh, 
It was an internal true righteousness based on faith in God's word. And that's that's clear from, from what follows that we're going to see in verses 21 through 48. So it that's a powerful statement. They were like going, wow, wow, how are we, we're going to, we're going to do, we have to exceed that because they were seeing all this external things and it was putting a burden and they're like, I just can't, I can't do it. All right. Now we also know that trick question. I know you guys know this, but I'm going to do it again to have fun. How many here is righteous? You better raise your hand. If you're a believer, you're righteous. God has claimed us to be righteous positionally because of Jesus. So we are we are already righteous, all right? But that's a result of an, an internal different type thing because now we have we have the Holy Spirit now who, who lives within us. So number four on your outline is my, righteousness and morality. Righteousness and morality, verses 21 through 48. And so Jesus rejects the traditions of the Pharisees and their practices. Now, in verse 21 through 26, his first illustration pertained to an important commandment, and that's do not murder. So let's 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 see here these principles that are around murder and hate and all those things. He says, and you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Okay. Well, yeah, we saw that, that God said that. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. Before the altar and go, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're, uh, uh, while you are, a uh, little, uh, I'm sorry, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. So he's talking about murder, all right? Now, there's a different, what's the difference between murder and killing? Okay, well, okay, one is intentional, but can you kill something intentionally? Okay, so you're going in the right direction, right? So he, keep that thought. What else is, what is another difference between killing and, and, and murder? You're, you're, you're heading in the right direction. Premeditation. Okay, well, the killing could include self-defense. That would not be murder. So where would that go? And Don, what did you say, brother? premeditated yeah there's a level of, yep there's a level of premeditation here's the thing it's it's an emotional thing there's a level of hate there's a there's malice all of these things that's involved in murder all right and and all the nuances around it it's premeditated it's intentional i'm i'm going to end the life of this person because i'm angry at them whatever the case may be and it's and it's outside of god's standard of what is allowed up for those things, whereas killing in a lot in times could be uh, by accident, um, war. All right, war is justified in the Word of God. There, there are some folks that disagree with that, but you know, in general, I think most of us agree uh, that is not murder. Um, uh, that would be killing. But again, some people have a conviction against that. But th th there's there's a difference, right? And and so we understand murder and the word that there's th in the Hebrew, there's there's two different words. Murder is one word, killing is another. There, in other words, it's not one word that describes. They're two different type things. And of course, the law says, "Thou shalt not murder." 
right? So he goes on here. Um, uh, the, the Pharisees taught that murder consists of taking someone's life. That's true. But the Lord said that the command that extended to not only to the act itself, but also to the internal attitude behind the act. And so, in other words, such wrongful attitudes uh, um, are, are, should be dealt with and made right. You know, so he goes on, he, he says, he says, you've heard that it says of old, you should not murder. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to be liable to judgment. Well, that's appropriate. Um, that was the law. But he says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And, and so, in other words, it starts, he's pointing out here this internal aspects that we all deal with. He, that's the beauty of our Lord is he gets to the heart, intentional pun there, of the matter, because that's what does these things. See, you, you know, you could you could uh, um, murder someone and, and you're held accountable, but it ultimately deals with what was... Uh, what our Lord wants us to see is what led to that, all right? Uh, you know, when, when people get to the point to where they're so angry that they murder someone or they, they're, they're deceptive, the problem is a hard problem, right? It's That's ultimately what it is. And he goes on, he says, you know what? He, pretty much you're saying, he's saying, if you if you hate your brother, all right, you, you've already committed, and he'll do that in another place, uh, in the Gospels, you've already committed murder in your heart. So that's what he wants them to be able to go. And then um, he goes on uh, and talks about, you know, just insulting them will be liable to the council. So in other words, that was a thing that was part of that culture. If you insult someone, that culture was very much on on honor and respect and so forth. He says, uh, uh, if you say you fool, you'll be liable to the the hell of fire. Again, it's a heart issue there. And so he goes, listen, you know, you want to worship God. You've got to get the internal taken care of first. This is where he hits in verse 23. He says, if you're offering your gift to the altar, and then you remember that your brother has something against you, in other words, you know it, what do you do? You reconcile. He says, before you go there, you leave your gift there and, and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, I want to talk about this just a little bit for practical application. Um, so you're offering a gift. In other words, you're making a sacrifice. In other words, you're, you're, you're worshiping God through whatever means that you're doing it. Even prayer is a form of, of that. All right. And you know that you've got a problem with someone else. All right. You've offended them or whatever the case may be. Um, what's the problem of just continually moving forward and ignoring that? What's what's the problem? Rude your fellowship. What else? You're you're. Okay. Yeah. So there's there is this this reality of, and so many of us have done that. In other words, you know, we know that there's something, and it can go well beyond just you know reconciling with someone and so forth. But a lot of times, that's a big deal. It's a heart problem. And we'll just go on and and uh, wondering why God doesn't answer our prayers or, or wondering why uh, we're struggling with things or we feel miserable. You know, that's just the Holy Spirit going, you need to get this other thing right first. You need to, to tackle this first. Now, we also know the, the Bible tells us, as, as uh, Paul, one of the writers, was telling us in writing to the church, to do everything that we can to be at peace with all men. In other words, the key there is to do everything within your power, everything that you can. There's sometimes, there's, there's nothing you can do. That's not what we're talking about. 
We're talking about knowledge, intentional things of that there is a problem. You need to make the attempt to reconcile and then come back. I know we know that, but that's an encouragement to us all because when we go to the Lord in prayer or we're serving him or we're bringing our things, um, you know, our offering our gift or whatever, uh, we need to take that opportunity to just to see is there is there some type of reconciliation that needs to take place first? Sometimes we got to swallow a little bit of pride for us to be able to do that. He says, make sure that you reconcile to your brother first and then come back. And then he says, come to terms quickly with your accuser. This is kind of another thing that was in that culture. So in other words, the way that they would do that is that if you're if someone accused you of something and it's like, all right, well, then let's go to court. And you're, you're going there. He's going, hey, listen, it's best. Look here what he says. Let your accuser you hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard. You'd be put in prison. In other words, he's saying, you know what? You might find out you're going to take a risk if you just stand your ground without trying to reconcile because you might end up in prison. You might end up losing all the things. So that's what our Lord's doing. He says, go to the heart of the matter and to be able to do that. He says, truly to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So that's one thing. A second illustrated in verse 27 through 30 is dealing with the problem of lust and adultery and so forth. Uh, let's look here in these, these verses. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her where? In his heart. All right. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better for you to lose one of your members than, uh, than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body uh, go into hell. Now, I think most of us understand that. We don't go around popping out our eyes or chopping up our hands. It's hyperbole to make a point. And so, uh, you know, the Pharisees' teaching was only concerned with the outward act, again, of adultery. In other words, you know, God did give permission, and we see later on where he makes a point with, with the Pharisees on that, he says, because of the hardness of your heart, but it was never intended for um, a, 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 a man, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting on divorce, for adultery. Um, in other words, you're just, your problem is it starts with, if you go fully through the act of cheating on your mate, on your spouse through adultery, uh, where did it start? Started in the heart, right? It started, that is just, that is such the danger of just pornography. And it's just, it's just, it's like images that get in our minds that we just cannot, that's where it, it starts. It's so dangerous. And so many uh, godly uh, men and women uh, have ended up in divorce and all of those things because of pornography and all of this, and it's men and women, you know? Uh, and so the Pharisees' teaching was concerned only with that outward act. Um, they said the only way that one could commit adultery was through an act of sexual union. They they correctly quoted that commandment, but they missed the point. Again, adultery begins with the heart and looking lustfully. Now, I, I'm saying this, and I, I'm not trying to even sound super spiritual, but I know I am flesh, right? And, you know, I literally sing the song, be careful little eyes what you see. I have to, all right? Because, you know, it's going down the road, you know, see, you know, female or something like that. I just like have to, you know, the, the natural fleshly part wants to gaze, right? And so I start singing, oh, be careful, little light. It, 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 because the father up above is looking down love, all right? And so you have to train ourselves, make a covenant with our eyes about not looking on the scenes because that's where it starts. You start noodling and all that. And we're all flesh and it's so easy to do. And then one thing leads to another and one thing leads to another and one thing leads to another. And we never get fully satisfied. Then the next thing you know, we commit adultery. And it all started with the heart. 
So he says, if you look on someone with lust, that's where it starts. All right. Now, don't justify, say, well, I've already committed adultery. I'll just go ahead and move forward. Don't do that either. That would be dumb. All right. Um, so uh, in verse 31 and 32, uh, then there was this idea of, of divorce. It, he goes on. He says, uh, it is also said. Oh, and by the way, let's, you know, I think you guys understand that hyperbole. In other words, he's saying you need to go through drastic measures to keep lust in control. That's, that's, you know, I have, I have covenant eyes on my phone. I have it on my computer. Um, uh, if I, if there's a situation, all right, to where uh, I'm, I'm uh, in a place to where it's just doesn't, it's not right? It doesn't look right if I'm with someone of the opposite sex, a female, all right? I will immediately text my wife, all right? And by the way, she knows where I'm going because we have little things on our, our phones where we can find one other and say, I'm just letting you know I have so-and-so in the car with me. And those are those drastic measures and so forth. It's accountability, all right? So now I'm going to think twice if some stupid thought gets in my mind and go, her, her, you know? And, and it's like, my wife already knows about this. She's seeing where I'm going and she knows who's in the car with me. All right. That's just, that's that drastic cut off your hands, pop out your eyeballs. And we can think you, you need to determine what works for you to be able to, to keep from being tempted on those things. And then it starts making it a little bit easier, if you will, because of accountability and things. It's like you said, if you feed the flesh, the flesh is going to get stronger. We have to, we have to feed then there is it what's the verse about i can't think of it about um not oh, i can't think what it is about not oh not showing evil or oh i can't think of it that you're not portraying oh in other words to, in other words uh to to not even give the appearance of evil. Yes, yes, yeah. that one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then there's also the thing that says, like the proverb says, I will set, well, no, it's a it's a psalm. I'll set no no evil thing in front of my eyes, you know, because all of those things, it's just like that portal. Right. And yes, just the appearance of evil. You may be totally innocent, you know. So, you know, uh sometimes you may be accused of something and it's just wasn't there. But all the stop gaps that we can put in the way is helpful. To be able to do that because we're all flesh all right is it a bug it's a frog a baby frog we have a baby frog in here. yes no don't kill it oh they're cute all right and you will not get warts by picking them up yet all right don't don't stomp on that thing i'll take him out with you he's not alive oh he's already dead all right <laughs> sorry all right so then he goes in verse 31 and 32. He says, it was, it, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he's, again, he's using very specifics. It's the matter of the heart to where that goes. You got to understand the principles here that's going on. The Jewish leaders were of two schools. They had two primary teachings that they kind of went through through the many, many years on the matter of divorce. Those who, there was one dude by the name of Hillel uh, said it was permissible for a husband to divorce his wife for any reason at all. That was, he was a Jewish uh, teacher, a rabbi. That basically, and they they just a lot. They kind of followed in that thing. You, you know, you don't like her, give her a bill of divorce. She's not meeting your needs anymore. Whatever you don't like it because she woke up with a pimple on her nose. Whatever, all right, divorce. Then there was, uh, but the other group, there was another guy by the name of Shammai, uh, said divorce was permissible only for a major offense. Well, how do you define a major offense? And then they'd start working through that, like what constituted that? And then it's like, well, you know what? I'll just give a bill of divorce and I can just kind of let it go. Um, but in his response, the Lord strongly taught that marriage is uh, is viewed by God as, a, as an indissolvable unit 
and that marriages should not be terminated by divorce. And then there's that exception clause. And, and he's like, he's like, you know, there are exceptions to these things, but it's still not his desire. You know, there's many people that have gone through that and reconciliation has happened and then their marriage is even stronger. All right. Um, and so uh, in, in Matthew, you can just put a little side in it. Matthew 19, we'll get there someday uh, in verses one through 12. He builds on that even in more detail. Once we get there, we'll kind of kind of go back and forth between the things. All right. So I'm going to uh, look at verse 33 through 37. Now about oaths, he says, again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform uh, to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. If you have hair, let not let what you say be simply yes or no. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So in other words, so we think about this principle. It's like, wow, that's pretty powerful. In other words, so there they would uh, Leviticus chapter 19, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23 uh, talks about oaths and making these oaths. But the Pharisees were notorious for making oaths, which uh, were made on the least provocation, something that would get them to do that. Yet they made allowances for mental reservations within their oaths. In other words, they had loopholes. They'd say, you know, I swear, you know, on the temple, or I swear on diff different things, but they had, they were relieved. Um, uh, uh, by these things. Um, let me read my notes here. He says, it, he says, if they wanted to be uh, relieved of oaths they had made by heaven, by the earth, or by Jerusalem, or by their head, they could argue that since God himself had not been involved in their, in their oaths, they were not binding. You know, I mean, how many here as a kid has ever, you know, it's kind of like crossing your fingers, you know? It's like, I, I promise, or or, or, or pinky promise, and it's like, well, yeah, we made a pinky promise, but I used my left pinky <laughs> instead of my right pinky, so therefore, it didn't matter. I mean, really, that's how ridiculous that they were getting with these oaths and so forth, uh, and then our Lord, we're going to see later on, gets on them about they had ways of being able to get their parents' inheritance uh, early and then leave them with nothing, with oaths and stuff that they, it was just, they were, they were, their hearts were so evil and hard. But Jesus goes on, he says, he says, listen, oaths shouldn't even be necessary. Think about why we make an oath. How many of us I swear? I swear. Now, there's some people that have a conviction about even putting their hand on the Bible and, and swearing to the Bible. All right. I respect that conviction. All right. In other words, you need to accept my yes is yes and my no is no. Unfortunately, we live in a culture to where if you don't do that, they're going to automatically assume you're guilty. So it's kind of a, a no-win type thing. All right. But why should we not have an oath at all? Because you should be a man or woman of your word. There you go. It, if, if you have a what? Oh, um, no, that's a covenant promise. We call them both out vows, but that's that's different. And that's that's a good point, though, right? Uh, but the principle is still there. And you're, you're kind of like saying, you know, I, I take you in, in sickness and in hell. The question was, what about when we take vows at our, our wedding and so forth? Uh, you, you know, you could go to the point to where you just say, listen, I'm going to love you. You're going to just have to take my word for it. All right. You know, uh, but I think we're talking about that's a covenant, though. We're making a covenant before God. But outside of that, when we when we just like, you know what? I I swear I, you know, I swear on my on my mother's grave. Or I don't know why I'm doing that in a southern accent, but you, you guys get <laughs> get the point. All right. Why do we do stuff like that? 
What are we trying to convey? That you should believe me. I'm going to the point to where I'm doing that. You know, um, our Lord's just going, you don't even need that. Just let your yes be yes, your no be no, and then follow through, right? <laughs> you, you, you know, Renee's going, just follow through. That's the point. You have to follow through. And then when you give someone your word, you know, uh, you know, you, you think about, it. we've known those people who constantly go back on their word. That's when they throw out the oath. It's like, yeah, I know I've messed up in the past. I know I've done that. But I swear on Liberty Baptist Church, the Bible, my grandma's grave, and all of these things, this is truth. Well, if their yes would have been yes, or their no would have been no in the first place, they would never even have to get to that point. But the Pharisees were really popular about doing the things. Um, let's uh, let's see if we can get through the end of chapter five, uh, starting in verse thirty-eight. Um, uh, he says, "You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil." But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone should sue you uh, and take your tunic, let him have your tunic cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow for you. Again, we're talking about the heart. We're, we're talking about principles here that he's laying out. The word for eye for eye comes out of Old Testament passages, right? In other words, in God's economy at that particular time, there was a level of retaliation that was appropriate. In other words, if somebody murders someone, you you kill them. In other words, they're responsible. There's accountability. You stone them. There was accountability. There was consequences for those things. Uh, comes out of Exodus 21, out of Leviticus 24, Deuteronomy 19. Uh, it's called lex tullianus, uh, the, the law of retaliation. But our Lord here, he pointed out, however, that while the rights of the innocent were protected by the law, the righteous need not necessarily claim their rights. A righteous man would be characterized by humility and, and, and selflessness through those different type things. You know, and he, he, he goes on, he basically, he says, yeah, and, and that's the thing. Our response to these things, I hope that we all agree, is, is, a, is a measure of the heart. You know, we have our rights, you know, and they, they, it doesn't mean we allow people to walk all over us, but it starts with a heart and an intention to different type thing. Yes, there's sometimes that we need to get law involved or um, legal ramifications. If it's within the body of Christ, it needs to start there unless it's like really clearly illegal and that we need to get the, the law involved. But the point is, um, if someone slaps you, you should give them the other cheek. Now, what is that saying? Because I know what my flesh wants to do. All right. But what is our Lord saying? He says, go ahead and just turn the other cheek. What is he ultimately saying? Okay, there's a level of forgiveness there. What else? It says, you get someone slapped, you give them the other cheek. Humility. Yeah, there's a level of humility. Be like Christ. Be like Christ. I mean, all these things are right. It, it's, it's a matter of responding with the heart as opposed to responding with the flesh. And, you know, uh, hey, I don't, there's, there's certain pain that someone can give me that I get very quickly angry and I, I would have to be careful that I might not pound them, all right? Uh, I, I, if someone slaps me on the back, you know, I don't like that. It's just painful. And, and my, my immediate response is to swing around and slap. So please don't slap me on the back. All right. Uh, but it's a matter of, 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 of the heart, because if someone, for whatever reason, came up and someone, usually if someone's going to slap you, 
what what's what led to that? Yeah, physical slapping. Somebody somebody because slapped you in the face. That was a nice loud noise too, right? And if they did that, what what usually led to that? You probably insulted them. Okay, you could have insulted them. You maybe mouthed off. Just an argument, right? And it, it, so somewhere along the line, anger boiled up between one of the two parties. Usually it's the person slapping you, they're angry, but you might have already been angry too. You might have said or done something that you deserve the slap. And I say that loosely, all right? So, but our Lord is going, I think, and I'll, this is where I love the principle, and I may be wrong on this, but I, I believe this is the principle because it's a heart thing. It's a matter of, I'm giving you my other cheek and I'm not going to respond to that in the same way because there may be a myriad of reasons on why that happened. You know, um, it doesn't mean that, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I think most of us, another principle we could use instead of like, instead of slapping them back, just get out of the way you know, or whatever. It doesn't, I, you know, it's like, oh, give me the other side. It's it's a matter of the heart. And and then it just kind of goes on. Uh, he says, uh, and if anyone should sue you uh, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Again, it's a matter of the heart. In other words, you're not going to respond in a sinful, fleshly way. He's like, he's using hyperbole here to make make the point. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, all this, by the way, was common in the Roman uh, uh, persecution that they had there. They would require them. They would take, you know, people and they would say, you carry this for, you know, for the mile. And they were only required to do it for a mile. You know, in other words, whatever measurement they had at that particular point. Uh, he's saying, you know what? Go further. Go Go further. Even though uh, you're only obligated to do the one, take it further. Uh, he says, um, give the one who breaks from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. It's all a matter of the heart. If we were to practice the principles as believers all the time in these things, what would that do? And by the way, there is such a thing as righteous anger and indignation, all those things, all right? But as believers, if we practice these principles, what would that do? Well, we would clearly be more like Jesus. And so, but what, what would the impact be? It, it would be more peaceful and... and it, yes, and and all the things that what we're what we're saying, where, where where my head also goes is that people would see that there's something clearly different in us, because the natural fleshly response is to respond in likewise. In other words, you know, if uh, if someone wronged you or so forth, and you pour extra love and grace on that it just has the potential to burn in hearts but there's the fine line we live in the real world too you know we don't want people walking all over it but it's a matter of the heart it's a matter of the principles but even if you need to retaliate in some way we need to seek our heart ultimately why is it that i want to do that is it because it's just it's just right and it's godly principles or is it retaliation and I'm just angry and I want to get back at them? That's kind of what I believe our Lord here is doing. And it's hard to do. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Yes, that is so true. Yeah, Renee's pointing out the difference between reaction and responding. Uh, and, and you're right. In other words, response at least has a, a level of noodling it before I move forward and so forth. 
So I believe that's what our Lord here is, is, is talking about, this, this, this heart issue. All right, and then, and then we'll wrap up here uh, very quickly uh, in verses 43 through 48. Um, so he says, you've heard uh, that it was said. Could you imagine our Lord? Could you imagine being there with him? And he's just, he's just chatting. He's just talking. He says, you've heard all this stuff. Now, we've heard this a million times. But to them, this is like, whoa, this is new. It, whoa, this is different. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Because that's what was being taught. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Oh, my goodness. How easy is that? Not. He says, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust, for if you love those who love you, that reward, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers that were more, uh, are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is, imper is, is, is perfect. So th that again is this practical thing that that he is teaching here that we are to be to be different. It is easy to love someone who loves you. In other words, clearly there's an emotional connection. It is very challenging to love someone who is our enemy. Um, why? Well, yeah, they deserve it, right? So there. So you guys know this. I'm going to just go there again because I do it a million times because it's really just practical. Love has emotion, but love is not the type of love that we're talking about. here. We're talking about unconditional. And so that's the hard part. In other words, I love my enemy in spite of my enemy. In spite of them, I choose to love them. You know, you take 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4, 4 through, anyway, anyway, you know what I'm talking about, 13, 4 through 6, 4 through 7, all right? We have this very de clearly defined level of what love is. This is what it looks like. It's demonstrated. It's actionable. And he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your, your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what the Pharisees have been teaching, all right? In other words, you 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 hate them because they hate you. And you love them because they love you, all right. And you're good with that. It's good. You're you're in favor with God. That's what they that's what they be teaching. You go, no, 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 no. I'm here to tell you, love your enemies. I, I'm here to tell you, um, uh, and pray for those who persecute you. That was totally, totally way different than they had been taught. And so, it's a new way of life for them. And so I'll end there. I could rattle on more and more uh, about these things, um, but it is a beautiful, practical thing. As he did the Sermon on the Mount, as he was teaching these people this, that was totally different than what they had been taught before. That's why they followed him. That's why they were attracted to him. Now, when he starts talking later on more deep things, that's when they start going, wait a minute, I'm not, that doesn't, when you talk about eating flesh and drinking blood and all that, we'll get there. All right. Okay. Any thoughts or questions or anything before we close? Anybody online? Everybody's muted. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. All right. I'm yes. glad to be saved. Say that again. I'm glad that I'm saved. Oh, yes. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, we have the Holy Spirit within us. Could you, you know, and we still struggle, you know, Romans 7, that whole flesh and spiritual battle that's always, but you're right, sister, because, you know, the unsaved, you guys know what I'm going to say. The unsaved act the way they do because they are unsaved, they're lost. We should be surprised. We should love them, pray for them, things like that. All right, let's close. Father, we love you and thank you, God. Thank you for these dear people. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, we, we just count it a privilege to gather together around it. And Lord, may we put these principles into practice in our lives. 
Let us reflect on the truth. Sunday. Bless these dear people. Bless us, Lord, uh, until we gather together again this Sunday, unless you return or you have other plans for us. But Lord, may we honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. God bless you. We will catch you all later.